Safety pin cycle, very simplistically, is talking about how your innate intelligence talks to your body and how your body talks back to your innate intelligence. So when we talk about those words, some people may ask, well, what is innate intelligence? Innate intelligence is the intelligence within you that literally animates you and causes every cell to properly replicate and heal itself. It's the intelligence that communicates to every cell, mm -hmm. tissue, and organ, mm -hmm. and causes it to heal correctly. Could you get the door for me? So that intelligence is housed in the brain, but here's the interesting thing. Each cell has its own innate intelligence. You know what else has innate intelligence? That stuff we don't like. Bacteria has it, viruses has it, trees. Everything has an intelligence in it, and that's, it's inborn intelligence. So innate means inborn. The problem that we run into is when we start thinking that something like a virus is stagnant, but it has an intelligence in it, it's gonna continually change. So if we try to kill it off with a fungus, and that's what antibiotics are, then the virus can change and mutate, and now that's why we have viruses and bacteria specifically that have changed enough or their resistance to antibiotics. So they have to change the flu vaccine every year, right? Well, I'm not even going to go down that road. That's, that's, <laughs> I'll give you a, a whole, I got a whole talk on that one. Um, so what we're dealing with is that intelligence and its ability to communicate to your body. So simplistically, we have the brain here at the top, and then we have the body at the bottom. Now, when I put body, that means every single tissue, organ, and gland. That means the communication between the brain and the body, and the body back, that's gonna make basically a safety pin. And if, if you guys don't know what a safety pin is, there's these really old things <laughs> <laughs> that they used to use diapers. to attach things, like diapers and so forth like that. So a safety pin, if we're looking at it rudimentarily, is the connection between brain and body when it's connected. Now, I know I've taught this before in a very simplistic term and I'm gonna keep teaching it on that form, but then we're gonna get into a more complex way of looking at this. So, what do you think are things that can cause your safety tin to become open or to cause the connection between the brain and the body to not work at 100%? Subluxations. Yes, subluxations, exactly. Now, what are the causes of subluxation? Trauma, Trauma. 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 Thoughts. Trauma. Thoughts. and toxins. Stress, Stress. And toxins, and thoughts, right? The three T's. Trauma, toxin, and thought. Now, each one of those causes a different form of a subluxation or a different subluxation patterning. Each one specifically affects the body differently. So if we look at trauma, that's the easiest one for us to understand. Because that's a physical, very Newtonian view of how the body gets sick, looking at it very physically. So our body, say we're in a car, and somebody comes and hits us from the side. And that hit from the side is going to apply a stress to the body, which is going to cause the stimulus to go to one side of the brain or the other, because when the body is stimulated on one side, most people aren't aware that it goes up and then it crosses over and stimulates the other side. And then we actually talk down. So it's, it crosses over, and when it talks down, it goes from the, the left side down and it actually runs the same side. But that stimulus will overstimulate one side. So if you overstimulate the left side because you're hit on the right, then you're going to start having left side problems, so you become dominant, and you pull yourself up on that left side. That stimulus from that fall will cause those issues, or from a car accident, or a trip. So those are very easy for us to understand. So basically what will happen is we have our brain, and we have some stimuli coming in from the spinal cord, and it stimulates the brain on one side, and then the, as a byproduct, that whole side of the body will become overstimulated. So what do we see with this? People will have shoulder issues, hip issues, and it'll be unilateral or on one side of the body because the one brain is more productive on that one side. We'll also see things like overproduction of a kidney on that side. So the organs are related to this as well, as well as the glandular issues. So it really depends on where the stimuli is coming from 
on the certain tasks. Does that make sense, guys? So that one's easy. What about when we start getting into things such as a toxin or a thought, an emotional stimuli? Then we're going to start dealing with what exact side of the brain is that emotion tied to? How does the brain adapt based on that emotional stress? Is that stress going to cause us to hemispherize, which means go to one side more than the other, depending on our gender or depending on our type of thinking? Now, if we say gender, it's not actually true. It's just how we think. So are we more left or right brain dominant? Because as a general fact, 80% of women are right brain and 80% of men are left brain. But that doesn't mean all men are right brain and all women, or all men are left brain and all women are right brain. That's not true. It's just how we've learned to adapt or deal with stress. So, and I've talked about this before, but what it is is how do we adapt to that stress? If we have an emotional stress, and we see this quite common, but we, we say it anecdotally, but it's, it's really what causes diseases. Say somebody dies. And then with, say your spouse dies, usually within six months, the other person's gone because that emotional stress is so pungent and so hard on them that it literally causes changes in their body. So that same hemispherization or change in the brain, depending on which you are. So we'll make, you guys want this one to be right or left? Right. Right? Okay. We'll make it reading right. So this one's right, this one's left. Are we going to be dealing with a male or female subject? Male. Yeah. Male subject? Okay. Okay, Kim. So we're dealing with a male subject. So in general, what kind of brain does a male have 80% of the time? Left. Left brain dominant, right? Because they're very analytical, they're very goal-oriented. So we have an emotional stress. Say their significant other is angry at them. This will cause the left brain to become more dominant because they're gonna to go towards the side that it's easier for them to deal with stress. So it's, they're more of a logical person, so they're gonna to go to that left side dominance. Now that left side dominance is gonna cause specific issues in them that you aren't gonna see in females. Which side of the body is the heart on? Left. Ooh, it is on the left side, isn't it? What's, what kind of problems do males usually get? Heart problems. Ooh, they get heart problems, don't they? Do you think there's any correlation? The answer is yes because they're gonna be causing an overstimulation. Now the interesting thing about the heart is, is there's two different sympathetic chains that stimulate it. That's a lot of big words for there's two ways to speed the heart up. One is emotionally driven, and the other one is sympathetic or reactionary driven. So with a heart to get an arrhythmia, it means you have both of those nodes firing at different times, which means the heart is not contracting correctly which means that we have a high emotional as well as a high protective mechanism going on. And it's not always true, but a lot of the times you will see arrhythmias more in females than males because you're going to be seeing different brain and how they actually communicate. So with this, if we have an overstimulation, we're going to start seeing that heart pumping quicker, causing more stress. Now this is a general adaptation that we see in everybody, though. But based on how they react determines how the body's going to heal. Does that make sense? Okay. So basically, emotionally, we overstimulate the one side. Then we're going to see problems on that one side. The same thing we'll see in females with the right. So we'll see more autoimmune diseases go on the right. This actually has to tie into the mediated immunity. So each brain has a different mediated immunity. What that means simplistically is if you're a left brain dominated person, your immunity is more reactive to environmental toxins. So you react better to, if you go into the concept of vaccination, if you put in a stimuli in, you have more uh, T1 mediated immunity, which means that you have a, a TH1 mediated immunity, which means that immune system reacts better to bacteria, funguses, different things like that. Whereas females have more of a TH2 mediated immunity. What that means is it's more of, and it's a right brain dominance. So the right brain dominance is that. So if you turn up a TH2, it's not specific for bacteria toxins. It's more of a generalized immunity. And that's why we see females who are, have been extremely stressed get more of an autoimmune type reactions. 
So that's where they start getting the MS and um, the rheumatoid arthritis because that's a general adaptation. So the body says, we got to protect ourselves. The males are going to go out after specific bacteria, whereas the other, the, the right side, is going to go after more of a generalization and say, well, is that good or is that bad as a general? And sometimes it can overreact, and that's how we get specific autoimmune problems like rheumatoid. So what that means is, is let's just take rheumatoid. We have a joint. And inside of that joint is a capsule. And that capsule has cartilage in it. It's usually hyaline cartilage. So that means we have a cartilaginous joint in here. If that immune system is sent out to see who is foreign and who is, who is natural, and it comes in contact with this, and it decides that it's foreign, then guess what it does? It attacks every one of your joints. That's what rheumatoid arthritis is. It's an inflammatory arthritis where you attack your own body. And it's literally attacking it because it says, well, I came in and tested it and you said you were foreign because I don't have any of your re receptors or markers in my system. The problem with that is that with that TH2 mediated immunity, they don't have any of those bacterial markers. They don't have any of them, so they can overreact easier. Whereas the TH1, they're gonna go in and say, okay, I have my Rolodex, yes, you, you match, will pass on. Does that make sense? So that's how you're going to get a rheumatoid. It's actually an overreaction to the generalization of how the body works. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So if it's not reacting correctly, that's when we start getting problems. So we went through thoughts. Now we can go into chemical. Chemical can mess with everything. And that's what we do. In our society, we go, if I take this chemical, I can mess with something, and then my symptom will go away, simplistically. The problem with that is, is when you take a chemical and you decrease or increase the function of something, that is redundant, or it's used many different layers in the body. And because the same hormone or chemical is used repeatedly, then we get something that, that the pharmaceutical company will call a side effect. It's not a side effect. If you take the drug, you get that reaction. Now, does that sound like a direct effect or an indirect effect? Direct, right? If you take something and get something, it directly caused it. It's just a side effect because we don't want it to happen. Because that redundancy of the drug or the, the chemical that we have in the body, so we use it in multiple layers in multiple places. We use it in our brain, we use it in our kidneys. We'll use specific hormones re repeatedly throughout our body. And that's why we have all these specific side effects. So what that means simplistically is, is if we, say, take something like an SSRI or a painkiller, painkillers are easy for us to explain. So say we take a painkiller. Here's our brain, here's our nerve, and we're gonna go in on here where the neural junction is, where two things come together. And in the neural junction, that's a bad neural junction. <laughs> How they work is they communicate between two neurons. And when they communicate correctly between neurons, it'll send a signal. So on one side, we have all these neurotransmitters. And on the other side, we have receptor sites. What happens is, to block the pain signal, you'll be given a drug that will come in, and it will come in and it will stop these receptor sites from working correctly. So what it'll do is it'll come in and it'll send a little protein that blocks them. And that protein stops the receptor site. So what happens is, your body goes, we have pain. And then it'll shoot out this chemical, and the chemical will go up, but it has nowhere to go, and then it gets washed out. So you don't feel anything. So you go, well, I'm feeling good. There's nothing wrong with me. But your body's still staying in the signal, saying we have a problem, we have a problem, we have a problem, we have a problem. But you're not doing anything to make it better. That's why you can get bigger issues. If your body can't react correctly, that's when we start getting problems. Does that make sense? Now, that, that problem is an inability to react correctly. If we cannot react correctly, 
that's when we start getting issues. Because an example would be, let's take pain again. Pain is actually not a bad thing. Pain is the biggest blessing you can have because it tells you something is wrong and we should do something about it. We shouldn't mask it, make it run away. Because if something's wrong, we gotta look, what is the bigger picture? Do we have an emotional, chemical, or physical stress causing this pain? Are we gonna deal with our actual issue? Or are we gonna push it down inside and see if we can get sicker? Because that's what happens with people. So, we're gonna talk about pain. So if I put my hand on a hot stove, what does my body tell me that I'm doing stupid? How do I, what does it say? Stop being stupid. How do I get pain. that signal? <laughs> I get pain, right? Yeah, pain. pain, and it says, stop being stupid, you're hurting yourself. So pain's a good thing and it helps us. How about people who can't feel pain because they have specific diseases? Have you guys ever heard of diabetic neuropathy? neuropathy. Yeah. So what happens with somebody with diabetic neuropathy? What happens is their blood sugar levels go so high that the joint, usually in the feet, they can't feel anymore because the nerves actually get killed. What happens is there's a concentration gradient and the nerves actually get lice, so you die. So you can't feel what's happening correctly. So what happens is, mind my ankle drawing, it's gonna be really ugly. It's a clog. <laughs> Are we Dutch now? I actually am half Dutch. Me too, me too. <laughs> okay, so right in here we got cartilage. Take this as being the femur, this is being the foot. And we have little nerves that come down so we can feel what's going on and they shoot back up to the brain. Now, with that diabetic neuropathy, what happens is these nerve endings die. So you can't feel what's going on. <coughs> and if you can't feel what's going on, then you can walk around and think you're perfectly fine. And you're walking around feeling perfectly fine and then the joint actually starts getting destroyed. Because you don't stop yourself. You roll your ankle, oh, there's nothing wrong, I can just keep walking. That inflammatory process that you get from rolling your ankle is actually a way to stop you from hurting yourself. It's a natural tourniquet. It actually naturally stops any blood from hurting you that's been destroyed and stops you from hurting yourself. That's what the pain's there. So we keep hurting this, and then you can get what's called a Charcot's joint. And that means, simplistically, that it literally gets bone on bone, but the bone literally gets pushed through, and the joint gets all eaten up, and these people can't feel anything. Their foot's just all floppy, because they couldn't feel what's going on. And that's that feedback loop, that feedback feed forward, that um, safety pin cycle. So for you guys who don't remember, this is a safety pin. <laughs> I know a lot of people don't know what it is anymore. So. Those safety pins, so when it can communicate above and above, up and down, communicate correctly, then we can heal because the communication keeps it right. But if the communication is interfered with through a chemical, emotional, or physical stress, that's when we get a deviation. That deviation is called dis-ease. So what we want to be at is we want to be at a state of ease. This is health. That means everything is working correctly, functioning correctly, the organs, muscles, and glands are healthy. But then, if you have an inability to communicate correctly and you start growing tissue, then we get dis-ease. Do you guys, anybody take Latin or yep. hyphenated words? Dis means lack of. So lack of ease. This right here is the beginning of a dysfunction. There's no symptoms with dis-ease. All it means is we're not functioning correctly. And because we're not functioning correctly, we can keep growing the problem, but we don't feel anything. If you leave this long enough, then it will cause a disease. That disease is enough tissue damaged so that the organ will actually stop functioning correctly. On average, it takes a loss of 60% of neural productivity to get to the point where you can grow a disease. Because you literally regrow yourself every nine months. This is why we have to eat, this is why we have to walk around, this is why we do everything. To take care of ourselves so we remake ourselves correctly. But if we're not remaking ourselves correctly, this is how we grow dysfunctions. Does that make sense? So, a question I'll get from that is, 
Well, if that's true, why do I age? Real good question. Why do you age? The answer is, is that going through life, we have different chemical, emotional, and physical traumas that will actually interfere with the cells. So if we put enough chemical trauma in, you could agree that if we put chemical traumas in, that it could maybe cause a little change in the cell, right? Maybe an emotional trauma can change the cell a little. A physical trauma, we all know that will cause problems. That's what, say a physical trauma like we get cut, then we have a scar, right? Mm -hmm. That scar is tissue that has been changed. But if you notice, as you age, those scars shrink. And they shrink because your body continually remakes itself and starts making those improper cells back into proper cells. The reason why I'm telling you this is because as we age, we continually remake ourselves every nine months. So if we remake ourselves at a state of ease, then we start growing health. We start growing happiness. We start growing back into a normal functioning state. How do we control this though? How do we make sure that we're reproducing ourselves in a state of ease or health and happiness and not a state of dis-ease or dysfunction? And the answer is communication. The pathways of communication determine if we make ourselves healthy or if we make ourselves sick. Because dysfunction and disease is not an entity. You cannot fight cancer. Cancer are cells in your own body that have gone rogue. That's what cancer is. They are not an entity. They are not a ship or a boat. They are actually your body not working right. Just because you name it doesn't mean anything. We can name anything. It doesn't mean it's right. So we can say, well, you have coccygina, you have halicitis or something. That just means you have inflammation. I'll give you a little secret. When you go to a medical doctor, and you come in and you say, my big toe hurts, and they come back and tell you a thing in Latin, they're telling you exactly what you told them in Latin and then charging you $200. That's literally what it is. It's real simple. We learn the same stuff in school as medical doctors. It's just a lot of people like knowing that if I have a name in Latin, then I have an explanation of why I have a problem. The problem with that is that people become their problem. They become their XYZ. All of these things are things we grow. And if we understand that we grow dysfunction and we grow health, then we can understand that we can grow back into health. And that's the goal of the body, is to always heal and always take care of itself. Both biblically and genetically, we're supposed to live to 120 to 140 years of age. That's what we're given. The reason we're not getting there is we're not communicating correctly. If we can't communicate and have that safety pin working correctly between our brain and our body and our body and our brain, then we start getting different dysfunctions. And these dysfunctions are real simplistic. I'm going to give you the answer to every single disease. It has one of two answers. You're either working too quick or too slow. That's the answer for everything. You have blah, blah, blah. So let's take diabetes. You're not working fast enough. Your insulin cannot be produced fast enough, so you're working too slow, so you have diabetes. That's, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So say we talk about another thing, tachycardia. Your heart is going too fast, so you have high blood pressure. Too low, bradycardia. You can go through literally any disease and it's due to one of two things, too much or not enough. That's all it is. There's no magic formula here. It's the cells either working too fast or too slow. So why would that happen? Well, why would happen is the brain, the master control center, can't talk to the body correctly. And then the body can't talk back. So this communication between the brain and the body, what system do you think controls that? The nervous system. The nerve system does, right? Between the brain and the body and the body and the brain, this is the nerve system. This is the spinal cord and the nerves going out. It's the master control system. So say we have something real simple. Let's talk about our heart going too fast. So why would that happen? Well, say we have a subluxation, and a subluxation means a misalignment due to a brain imbalance causing the body to be out of alignment, actually compressing the nerve. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the brain's way stronger on one side, pulling the body out, causing it to not work correctly. 
and say it's, it's coming here and it's not allowing the afferent fibers or the fibers that come back to the brain to not work correctly. So these fibers aren't working correctly. And the brain goes, okay heart, speed up. And the heart speeds up and the body goes back, okay we're sped up and the brain goes, you didn't do anything, I didn't see anything, I'm not hearing anything, speed up again, speed up again, speed up again. And it goes really, really fast because it's not getting that signal back saying, hey I'm already doing 35, can you slow me down now? Does that make sense? That's how you get stuff that goes too quick. That's how those diseases come about. How about the ones that go slow? Where do you think I'm going to go with this? The opposite. The opposite, right? So the brain is going and it's talking to the body, but it's not talking correctly. And let's say the heart is pumping too slow. And because it's pumping, it's pumping slow, the body sends a signal back and says, we're going at 35. Well, maybe it, says it, maybe it says we're going even faster. Maybe we're going at 40. But the body needs it to pump at 66. And then it fires, and then it fires again and it says, oh, we're going at 66. And it fires up. Basically, what I'm showing here is this. When the, when the body sends a signal back and the brain sees what it wants to see, it doesn't mean that the response is going to be correct. Does that make sense? So we're, we can have the body literally going, okay, we're supposed to have our heart beating at a specific frequency. And the signal may be aberrated and say that it's actually coming in at that frequency. How the body communicates is actually through waves. And when you physically cause a compression or change of the nerve, that waveform will change. And so when that waveform changes, instead of getting, do you guys know what an analog wave is? I know you guys do. Yep. So an analog wave is a full waveform. Instead of a binary, it goes up, down, up, down. But if you cause a compression, you can cause the body to start working in binary. So it won't communicate correctly. So if it can't con communicate correctly, it'll keep itself too low. And then we get diseases of, like, Things like we don't burn off fat quick enough because we're not producing the right hormones because the body thinks we have the right hormonal levels. Does that make that, sense? Mm -hmm. Quick question. Would that be why a person who obviously has hormonal issues visibly mm -hmm. would have blood work that shows a picture-perfect poster child of normal health? Yeah, they could have no issues. The body, the, the blood work could actually 100% come out perfect, right? Yep, every time. But what you'll look at is, are the cells able to respond correctly? The blood work tells us what's going on in the blood. It doesn't tell us what's going on in every single cell. So depending on what kind of stress you're in can also lead to that as well. Because the major thing that we deal with in our society is how do we respond to stress? Type 2 diabetes on general is caused by excess stress and an increased production of glucocorticoids. So what that means simplistically is, is when your body is under stress, it has to metabolize a lot of sugar to use it. So it pushes it all out. Now, at the same time, it pushes out glucocorticoids that says, don't be using this anywhere else but the muscles, because the muscles are the only ones that need to use it right now because we're stressed and we gotta run away. Because stress is a short-term response for either fighting something off or running away. But as a byproduct of that, now all those cells, those fat cells, become insulin resistant because that's what the glucocorticoid does. It says, you're not allowed in here, you're supposed to go be used at the muscle. And if we continually do this over and over and over again, then we get things like type 2 diabetes. Then we get the, the insulin resistance <clears throat> issues. Then we start getting different factors that don't allow us to heal correctly. We get fatigued because we push out all this energy, then the cells that are supposed to take the energy back, the fat cells, are saying, no, 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 you're supposed to be out there running away. But you're driving down the road and some guy just flipped you off. So you don't need to use all that energy. Does that make sense? So then it's like, no, 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 you're not allowed to use this, and eventually the body can slow down, but then you use up that energy, because you're gonna use energy to move and metabolize it, 
use up that energy and then you can't get back in so you you keep using in the up and down up and down and then your body won't work correctly does that make sense so over or under production is how the brain can't talk to the body and the body can't talk to the brain that's that safety pin cycle over under production causes of disease if we overproduce long enough we can get problems if we underproduce long enough we can get problems we can get big problems too say our body gets so stressed out because we've had this system firing too much and eventually you just burn out the nerve system then the immune system which are the, the blood cells they start doing whatever they want they start running around this is how we get those autoimmune problems ALS, cancer, rheumatoid, MS, fibromyalgia, Guillain-Barre, all of these problems, chronic fatigue syndrome, are because the nerve system can't control the immune system anymore. Because the body can't actually run itself anymore because it burned out the communication pathway. So what do we do with these people? These are people that are really, they're sick puppies. And it's because they can't communicate anymore. So I have to slowly coax that system back to health. I cannot adjust these people like a normal patient. It will literally burn out their system. Because the adjustment stimulates the nerve system, stimulates the brain, and causes it to get into a state of actually reacting correctly. So if I, I can literally adjust maybe three segments max on these people, and they have to be very light adjustments just to get the brain stimulating enough where it'll start functioning in the right brain frequencies so it will heal. And then the brain can start healing and the nerves will start communicating correctly. And then it'll say, hey, 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 no, you don't need to attack those joints that I drew, drew earlier. That's us. You don't need to attack that and then rheumatoid goes away. You don't need to attack the muscle or the motor nerves. And then you start seeing things like ALS going away because it's the body attacking itself because it's literally gone rogue. Does that make sense? Our goal is to make sure it communicates properly, 100% in, 100% back, and then every nine months, we get healthier and healthier and healthier. You can literally see people like Jack LaLanne, who, by the way, was a chiropractor. He invented those jumping jacks that everybody loved at school. <laughs> he, at the age of 92, swam the English Channel. So age doesn't mean that you, you get sick. These are lies. How old you are doesn't mean you're gonna get sick. Your genetics doesn't mean you're gonna get sick. What ethnicity you are doesn't mean you're gonna get sick. If you're a man or a woman doesn't mean you're gonna get sick. These are all lies that we're told to make us feel better so we can take things that actually slowly kill us. The answer is, it's how we live our life and how we communicate determines how healthy or sick we'll grow. If we communicate correctly, every nine months we grow better. If we do not do that, and we start causing bigger issues by having chemical, emotional, and physical stresses beyond the way, ability for us to heal, then we'll start growing sickness. And you'll say, okay, doc, that sounds interesting, but you know, in my family, heart disease runs in my family. Okay. That means how you deal with stress runs in your family. Cancer runs in my family. How you deal with stress runs in your family. These are taught traits. And I can give you a journal article about this, and it literally shows if there was a family, both the male and female, had heart disease in every member of their family on both sides. So they said, we're not going to have this problem. We're going to make sure we don't get this. We're going to adopt a child that has no heart disease. By the age of 30, that child had heart disease. It's a learned trait. How you do with stress deserve, determines these problems. And how I know this is, is because I literally do functional EEGs in this office. And from that scan, I can see how you do with stress is causing your heart problem. How you do with stress is causing your organ diseases. We can see it in the brain. The brain tells us functionally how the whole body will heal. And if it's balanced and communicating equally from side to side, then we'll heal. If it isn't though, then we start getting different things and we call them diseases. I really don't care what the name is. The cause, 95% of the time, is stress. I have to figure out how to de-stress your brain, emotionally, physically, and chemically, so that you'll learn how to heal. Does that make sense? 
and then make sure your safety pin is working right. Because if you can talk correctly, then you can heal correctly. And that's why we see miracles in this office. That's why we see people come in with things that are told they will never go away with, and within six months to two years, they're gone. An example of this is a lady, she's 73, and she's told she'll never be able to use her bladder again because she's just too old. Yeah, these are the weird things I hear. And now she's been under care for six months, and guess what? Her bladder's working fine, she's off her oxygen, and she's off three different blood pressure medications. Did I do that? No. Did she do that? Yes, because we made that communication pathway work correctly, so her body healed herself. The communication is the key. And when you communicate correctly, just like in a relationship, it works well. If you don't communicate correctly, then you get lots of problems. Does that make sense? So do you guys have any questions? Excellent. So I'll get you guys adjusted. And just think of any friends or family members who don't know these things. And <coughs> let them know that these talks are free. I just want to educate our community and let them know that they are empowered and they can take care of themselves, that they don't have to be victims. That each and every one of you guys has the ability to heal to 120 to 140 years of age and you don't have to crawl to death in your last 15 years of life or last 10 years of life. I want to see each and every one of you guys be lights that literally changes our community. Thank you.